and I'm a member of the, um, I volunteer with the OLLI program committee. I'm happy that so many of you are here today. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, Janet Clare is the director of the Senior Center and has a couple things she'd like to tell you. Hi everybody, welcome on this spring rainy day. I'm so glad to see the room fill up today despite the rain. Yeah. And I just wanted to thank everyone for another wonderful season of partnering with Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It's always a pleasure for us to bring these wonderful quality and well attended lectures to the senior activity and make them more accessible to more people. Um, if you aren't aware, we also have a lot of great programs starting next week. We have our spring summer quarter beginning. We have over 80 wonderful classes. About half of those are in movement. Some of them happen right in this very room, but there's also a studio next door where there's lots of yoga, so we've got strength training. There's also foreign language. We have a new memoir class. Lots of wonderful classes. If you'd like to learn more or sign up, um, our newsletter's here. We've got lots of forms downstairs. Feel free to stop by the office when you're done here. And we also have a special event coming up this weekend, which is our annual rummage sale. Very different from everything else happening. Um, but that's Friday and Saturday. And um, I also wanted to let you know that with Osher not running through the summer, we are always really thrilled to um, put up new lectures and presentations. And if any of you um, have something to propose, I would be really happy to receive proposals from anyone and share them with our program committee that reviews them. So feel free to get in touch. And thanks again for coming. Thanks, Osher, for your wonderful partnership. And thank you, Asma, for coming. And thank you, Jennifer, for all your help with setup. <laughs> if anyone needs the restroom, right here outside this room there's also water and I'll be right downstairs let me know if you need anything thank you sorry can't thank stay. You. Uh, just two short announcements before we get to the program at hand um, next week's this is the last of our uh, lecture series and following this there are three weeks of films uh, with Rick Winston and the topic that they're generally related films and the topic this year is cross-cultural encounters and collisions in 21st century film. And those take place at uh, 12.30 on Wednesdays at the Savoy Theater. So um, uh, this, there are copies of our brochure here that list what each week's movie, movie is. Uh, one last thing, on the 12th we are, uh, as, as probably most of you know, uh, Ali is a strictly volunteer organization. And we need more volunteers. So, I mean, we need some help. And, and it doesn't mean meetings. It doesn't mean lots of work. It means um, helping out where needed. We need help with setup. If Bob were not here, if his attendance record was not what it was, we would be in big trouble. You know, we need some backup. So it doesn't mean a huge commitment, but um, if you're interested, please let us know. And there is there is a meeting, kind of we, it's our program planning meeting on April 12th. What day is that? Thursday. Thursday, Thursday. a week from tomorrow, uh, at the library, the Kellogg Hubbard Library at 115. And everybody, anyone is willing to go, and if uh, is willing to is welcome to come. And um, if you can't come, don't want to come, but are interested in either giving us program ideas or volunteering, please see Bob, Mark, me, anybody. Uh, am I doing? A lot of people here are involved. Right. Okay. Grace, of course. Right here, stand up, Grace. <laughs> See, all right. Never mind the other ones, and, and also Lauren sitting next to her. Okay, as I said, a lot of people involved. All right, let's get to it. Um, Esma Alhuni has a degree in political science from Georgia State University, where she was the recipient of the university's 2016 Martin Luther King Humanitarian Award for her work on behalf of groups often marginalized by society. That's particularly meaningful today, which, yes, you know. Al Hooney has worked as an intern at the Georgia State Assembly and was the Community Outreach Director for the Council on American-Islamic Relations in Georgia, 
the largest Muslim civil rights organization in America. As a volunteer with Georgia Close Up, a nonpartisan educational organization, she helped educate students, teachers, and citizens about public policy in Georgia. She also volunteers her time with other grassroots organizations. Georgia Congressman Hank Johnson invited Alhuni to be his guest, as parenthetically, as a form of protest at President Trump's first address to Congress in uh, DC, where she spoke to the press on why she continues to fight oppressive regimes. Uh, okay. Uh, and last, and this is cute, you'll like this. Last year, a newspaper named her the giver of all dams. You give a dam, right? In their piece, in Atlanta's best. Elhuni is featured in the new documentary produced by Atlanta's Center for Civil and Human Rights, telling stories of six female activists in Georgia. She was among the contributors to the updated version of the new appeal for human rights in Georgia, and most recently she helped change the policy in Atlanta to allow Muslim women to wear their mandated hijab at the um, Atlanta Detention Center. al Huni has recently moved, thankfully for us, um, to the Upper Valley, where she resides with her husband. I give you Asma al -Huni. Gosh, thank you so much. Um, I am so honored to be here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Vermont Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, Edie, and all those who made today's presentation possible, including the Montpelier Senior Activities Center for opening their space uh, for us. So uh, I want this to be a safe space, so that means I want you to feel comfortable enough to ask me questions. Um, I will answer as many of your questions as possible, and uh, I think we'll just go ahead and start. So uh, this is the agenda, and the first thing I'm going to do is I would like to ask the audience what your goals are, what you would like to get from me, what questions would you like me to address, um, and then after that, uh, I'll address stereotypes, where they come from, and their consequences. I'll go over uh, the demographic of the Muslim community and also Muslim belief and practices. Thank you, Grace, so kindly uh, prepared to take on the, the next slide, which is your goals. Okay. I introduced you specifically. Yes, exactly. She's going to play a major part in today's presentation. All right. Okay, so I'd like to know from you guys, um, what do you want me to address today? So just raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and we could just write on the on the the board right there what you'd like me to talk about, what you'd like me to address. Yes. I'm interested in the posters on the blackboard. Yeah. Okay. So the posters. Yes. I'm interested in that garment and why you wear it. The garment, okay. Garment or head covering, all right. Yes. Um, I feel woefully ignorant about um, Islam in general, and if you can give some, I know that's a very deep topic, but if you can give some broad strokes <coughs> and how being a Muslim in America may be different from being a Muslim. Oh, yes, okay. So how being a Muslim in America <coughs> may differ <laughs> from, yep. <laughs> and also um, Islamic beliefs and practices? Sure. Okay. Yes. In every other religion, there are progressives and fundamentalists. There are people all over, so it's almost ridiculous to ask what do Christians think about something because they're all over the place. So I'm just assuming that's the same thing in Islam, but if you want to talk something about the variety of ways. Yeah, so diversity in Islam, that sounds like a good. Uh, somebody mentioned something here. Yes. I just came from a, a Spanish group, and today we were discussing, there's over 4,000 Arabic words in the Spanish language. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about how the language, is, are there quite a few Arabic words in English also? Or that would be interesting. Uh, okay, so the Arabic language, uh, related words. Week, right? <laughs> <laughs> related words um, in Arabic that we may be familiar with. Okay, um, anything else? 
Yes. Interested in the role of women and uh, rights of women. Okay. So the role of women. <laughs> Man, uh, that's what a role of men. The women don't have. <laughs> What are the role of men? The role of men. Oh, the role of men. Okay. Versus women. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so Muslims regard uh, Jesus as a prophet, and they also uh, practice in the religion of Abraham as do Jews. Yet, uh, Jews do not accept Muhammad as a prophet, nor do Christians. So, how do Muslims? discuss the fact that they regard the heads of uh, the way things go in Judaism and the way things go in Christianity as a prophet to mm. them, okay. and yet they are not, their prophet is not so regarded by the others as a <coughs> continuation of some tradition. How do they discuss this? Okay, that's a good question. That's a deep question. <laughs> okay, that's... That's good. All right. Um, I think we could get started. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, what does the average person think of? What comes to an average person's mind when they hear the word Islam and Muslims? And I'm not talking about you guys because you guys are woke. Uh, you invited me here, so that says something about you, that you're welcoming me. But what do you think the average person thinks about Islam and Muslims? Or what comes to mind? So I'm looking for words. <coughs> Bomb. Bomb. Terrorist. 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 Different. Different. Fear. Fear. Different clothing. Different clothing. Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, okay. <laughs> Average person. <laughs> All right, so there was a study done, um, and I'm going to give you the most popular answers to that study in the United States. And these are, who can read this for me? Raise your hand if you can really fast read what, what it says up here for me. Yes. Terrorist, fanatical, women oppressed, women submissive, women uneducated, women can't work, intolerant, un-American. That's right. So this shouldn't be new to everyone. I mean, you probably are familiar with these these stereotypes, um, and uh, if if some, maybe you're familiar with all of them. Okay, so all negative. they're all negative. Yes. Were there no positive responses? There actually were a few positive responses as well, but the majority are negative, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, okay, Islamophobia. Um, it's time to talk about Islamophobia and the negative perceptions of Islam and Muslims. So what is Islamophobia? How many people have heard this word? Raise your hands if you... Okay, so good. Um, who can tell me what they think Islamophobia means? Fear of, fear, of, fear, of, fear of Yes, exactly. So it's either fear or hatred of Islam or Muslim, and, and, and it results in uh, prejudices. It results, results in the marginalization, discrimination, um, sometimes violent acts <coughs> against Islam, uh, against Muslims, but also those perceived to be Muslims. So Muslims aren't the only ones that are victims of Islamophobia. Um, so these are the, the things that cause Islamophobia. So let me go over all of those. These are the driving factors. Um, we have media representations. So most everything we see about Islam and Muslims in the media um, are negative images, um, whether it's the news or movies. In fact, um, someone by the name of Jack Shaheen did a study and written a book uh, about the negative perceptions of uh, Islam and Arabs in in the media, including movies, and he found that the overwhelming representations that we get are negative. So I want you to put that in context, um, and you'll find out a little bit later uh, that only less than 1% of the U.S. population are Muslim. So if you're not going to come in contact with a Muslim, most likely, and everything you see is from the media, you can understand why that fuels Islamophobia, and, and there's no other like positive images to counter that. Um, 
Um, the second, uh, by the way, the word terrorism. How many times do we use the word terrorism when it comes to someone who's non-Muslim? So unfortunately, there is this bias where uh, if a violent person who is Muslim <laughs> happens to carry out um, an attack, we automatically will, will label him terrorist, right? We never question intentions yet. But when someone, um, I don't know, white or shooter that's, that's non-Muslim does something, we oftentimes will call them shooters uh, with mental problems, right? We, we don't want to label them terrorists. So there's that. Um, political rhetoric. Uh, politicians oftentimes scare people with uh, Islam and, and Muslims because uh, if you create fear, in people and you make yourselves out to be the hero, right? That will relieve you of your fear. You're likely to win campaigns. So a lot of politicians will play off of uh, Islamophobia and, and increase this. You'll notice in the media, that's when, when uh, Islamophobia or the hate for Islam comes about, including our own president, right? He used Islam to fuel this fear. Oh my gosh, they're, they're, they're coming to take over our country and spread Sharia law. And, um, violent extremists. So. Um, despite the fact that uh, there are a few people that are Muslims that do uh, violent acts, right? There are. We have our violent uh, extremists, just as any other faith, right? But despite that, we like to um, put responsibility on all Muslims for doing that. We, we, we don't do that to, to, say, a Christian person uh, who, who's a white supremacist or alt-right person. We don't say all, all white people or we don't say all Christians, but we tend to think uh, one uh, violent Muslim person does something and automatically all Muslims are violent, right? And so that goes into uh, Islamophobia. Uh, American foreign policy, um, Islamophobia is oftentimes utilized by our nation uh, to justify foreign policies abroad. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but uh, an example would be Afghanistan and how we went into Afghanistan and, and we used, uh, we're going to save the Muslim women in Afghanistan, so let's, let's go ahead and and um, for our military escapades there, right? Um, U.S. Islamophobia Network, somebody asked me to discuss what these are, and this is what this is. Uh, basically, there are people and groups who are literally making money off of creating hate uh, towards Islam and Muslims. It's a multi-million dollar industry. And so I thought it might be a good idea so you can see who these people are that literally make money off of creating hate. And so there's... Um, you can maybe, I don't want to waste too much time, but later you can come up and actually see who these people are. And so when you see them, and, and people bring them all the time, by the way, um, in the media as experts, even though they're very well-known Islamophobes and bigots. Um, and then last but not least, uh, knowledge from Orientalism, and Orientalism was a body of knowledge that started in Europe, mostly England and France, uh, to gain knowledge about those uh, they would soon subjugate and rule over through colonies. Uh, it, was, it continues today through neo-colonialism, uh, through economic and cultural hegemony, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly as well. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Has this Islamophobia happened after 9-11? So, um, I don't recall it growing up. I, it, it just seems to be that, that that was the starting point. Is that true? Is that your That's a really good question. And if you look in history, we always have to have an enemy. Um, if you have an enemy, it justifies putting money into our war machine and going abroad. And, and so after 9-11, yes, Muslims were the, the evil boogeyman, right? Um, before that, we know through history, we have, you know, the Irish were considered evil at one time, right? Jews, and still are, right? There's anti-Semitism today. The Russians, right? So we always have to have an enemy, and I think um, today uh, it's one of them is Islam and Muslims. So um, I wouldn't say it started at 9/11, but it has exasperated like uh, extremely after 9/11. Yeah. Yep. I have a question about the uh, chart. Yeah. And the question I, I, you know, without, I know you don't want to go into detail. But I'm wondering, is it mainly politicians? Is it mainly religious? No, there are uh, some lead organizations. Um, and you can come up here. Uh, I'm sure you heard of Robert Spencer, Pamela Geller. Um, they have websites and is just fueling hate. They create uh, activities and events. And um, 
Yesterday was a uh, punishable Muslim day, though I don't think any of these people created it. This was uh, something that somebody created in, in the UK, but it was basically um, a list of things. If you do these things to Muslim, you get points. Like, right, pull off a hijab, you get 10 points. Uh, kill a Muslim, you get 200 points. And so uh, our community basically did send out uh, um, just a warning to Muslims to be wary about their surroundings and because this is just, it's horrible, but. Right. Right, hate groups, right. Um, so, okay, so this is um, Laura Bush. And uh, Laura Bush is here, I think this was in the year 2001. She addressed the radio um, and she basically said the fight against terrorism is also a fight for the rights and the dignity of women. So making it okay for us to go into Afghanistan and do what we need to do, right? Um, let me just see what else I want to tell you about that. Let's just go on here. All right, Edward Said is uh, the father of critiquing Orientalism, the word I, I uh, introduced earlier. Orientalism started out as a study of Eastern cultures by the West, a way of seeing the world. It assumes a huge difference between the East and the West. Edward Said says there's a difference between knowledge and research to understand for coexistence purposes, and then there's the opposite, done to dominate, right? Um, and so we see there an institution, Orientalism is an institution for dealing with the Orient. If you don't know what Orient means, anybody know what Orient means? East. Good. And then the Occident would be its opposite, the West, right? Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry about that. Just want to make sure we. But basically, an institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by describing it, viewing it, teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism is a Western style for dominating restructuring and having authority, power over the Orient. And um, that is his book. This is his very famous book here called Orientalism. And this picture here captures exactly uh, what Orientalism is because you, you look at this picture and you think, wait, what is this? What culture is this? Is it Indian? Is it, is it uh, Iraqi? Is it, it, it's a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo stuffed in a picture and then called right the Orient, right? And that's how a lot of people viewed uh, the East. Lila Abu Laghoud, I'm sorry if you can't see her name there. Um, she wrote a book called Do Muslim Women Need Saving? It's an excellent book where she talks about the perceptions people have of Muslim women, um, but pretending to be rooted in the language of human rights. Uh, she critiques how no one really cared if these women were dying because of the war or uh, that they were still struggling even the, after the West has uh, emancipated them, right? So her critique goes very much hand in hand with saving brown women from their brown men, kind of like the white man's uh, burden. Jack Shaheen, which I talked about earlier, uh, who did the research on how Muslims and Arabs are, are uh, presented in the media, he basically boiled it down to the three Bs, the billionaire, the belly dancer, and the bomber. <laughs> And we all know what this is. Who, what is this? Aladdin. Aladdin. Who would like to sing what uh, the, the opening song of Aladdin? Who would like to sing that part? Oh, I come from a place, from a faraway place, where the caravan camels roam. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. These were real lyrics in the movie. So... This is McCain. If you recall, in 2008, he was running for president, and a woman gets up, and, and what does she say? She says, Obama is an Arab. You know, we can't have Obama as president. He's an Arab, right? Um, and, and what does McCain say? He says, he says, no, ma'am. 
No, ma'am. He's a decent family man, a citizen that just happens to have, who I just happen to have disagreements with. So what is that really saying? I mean, he thinks he did something great here, but what does that mean to someone like me or a Muslim child that hears him? Uh, it basically says that Muslims aren't decent family people. They can't be citizens. They're un-American, right? Um, and, and so that, even though he got a lot of credit for this, you know, people, but a lot of the Muslim community wondered how is this a good thing? This is Obama when he was running. People called him a terrorist. People called him Muslim. And uh, he responds to the claims that he's a Muslim and a terrorist by insisting that he's Christian and ignores the opportunity to challenge the association of Arab Muslims um, that they're terrorists, basically accepting the logic and only challenging his faith that he is Christian. So that's a lost opportunity there. So, um, of course, Donald Trump, um, and we all know uh, he's done many, many things. I just put three things up there. Um, so I think most recently is the retweets of anti-Muslim propaganda videos that the UK had by a hateful group called the Brit, uh, Britain First. Uh, they're fake videos of Muslims being violent, and he retweeted not once, not twice, but three times, <coughs> three times these uh, videos on, on his Twitter. And then also he stood up. Uh, against refugees, he said, oh, if we bring in refugees, they're going to be violent. And, and not one refugee in the United States, um, there was no violent act created by one refugee in the United States. So it's really interesting. The other thing is the Muslim ban. Um, I did not tell you my parents are from the country of Libya. I was born there. I came to the United States when I was two. Libya is one of the countries that are on the Muslim ban. Um, and so he banned seven majority Muslim countries um, from coming to the United States. Okay, um, so what are the consequences of these perceptions? So um, there's an increase in hate crimes. So I told you I worked for CARE, Georgia, the Council on American Islamic Relations, one of the largest <laughs> civil rights organizations in the United States. And what we found is this year alone, the amount of calls we've received on anti-Muslim um, biases uh, was the highest since 9-11. Um, again, and if the trajectory continues the way it does, it'll be the highest since 9-11. So it's really bad right now. Um, discrimination in the workplace is another problem that we found. They don't want Muslim women to cover um, their hair, or they won't allow people to pray, or um, just being mean and not allowing beards, or um, criminalization of Muslims. And there's so many ways that Muslims are criminalized in the United States through policies. Um, FBI targeting, the third highest uh, reason why Muslims call care is because of FBI targeting. So they have no association with any terrorist organization, but simply because their family comes from a, a different country or they visit uh, a different country, the FBI keeps targeting and bullying the Muslim community. Surveillance, they're being surveillance, they're on no-fly lists, secondary screening at airports. Um, of course, we talked about the Muslim ban. Anti-Sharia laws, if you don't know, uh, Sharia is, is fake. It's fake. It means law, right, religious law, but there is no law that all Muslims agree with. So it's something created to create hysteria within the United States. Um, and so they have these anti-Sharia laws, ordinances keeping mosques from being built. Uh, in Georgia, we had to fight. Uh, Newton County had um, an ordinance not allowing a mosque to be built because the community was just did not like Muslims and did not want that to happen. So they create ordinances to ensure that Muslims don't create houses of worship. Um, and then uh, Muslims feeling othered. Uh, and there's so many other things that happen, including every single major airline has kicked a Muslim off uh, a flight. And so I can give you, give you some examples of, of uh, situations where that has happened. Let's see if I can get that quickly. I may have lost that page, but I can just tell you that every single major airline has kicked a Muslim out for simply talking in Arabic, and somebody got scared and said, oh, they talked in Arabic. Um, so really silly things like that got uh, Muslims kicked off of planes. Excuse me? Uh, yeah. what, I'm a little confused about what you said about anti-Sharia law. What does the word Sharia mean? It's law. It's Islamic law. but. 
it's so there's no law? there's no exact look there's no Islamic law there's no so Sharia some people could say Sharia is um, giving charity to the poor right there's no power behind it right but there's many things in Sharia that people don't agree on right it also comes in when people say oh if somebody steals cut their hands off but yet there's no Muslim countries that really do that right um, so uh, it's 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 fake and that's why I say when you hear that word in this country just know it's being done again to create hysteria to create fear um, within the community so so uh, when I say Sharia is fake I'm saying there's no one Sharia that all Muslims agree on right and what they're trying to do is trying to make it uh, appear that Muslims are coming into this country to dominate they don't it's not about just living like everyone else we all have an agenda like as if we have an agenda we're coming to take over we want to take over the government we're trying to convert everyone it's just it's just this crazy idea Um, how Muslims are dealing with uh, Islamophobia. Some people are speaking out against it. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the lady on your left. That's Linda Sarsour. She is the leader of the Women's March on Washington. Uh, so some people are speaking out against it. Some have created communities, giving a sense of belonging. So after school programs uh, for Muslims so that they don't feel so othered. Um, Others are taking it to the courts and challenging unjust policies. Uh, for example, some people are suing Donald Trump for the Muslim ban. Some are trying to educate the public about uh, what to do if they witness hate, and we'll talk about that. So maybe you guys can have the tools to to act uh, once you see hate in front of you. Um, some are allying with marginalized communities uh, in demanding equality and fair treatment. And so you could see a picture. That's actually me in the. Uh, in the AJC paper uh, in Georgia, and I was, um, the, the sign basically says, civil rights are for everyone, America, it's time, and that was during a police shooting when a uh, unarmed black man died, and so you could see how Muslims are allying themselves with marginalized communities to seek their rights as well. Um, some are educating the public, uh, some are doing nothing because they're afraid that if they do anything, they'll further be targeted. So they're just laying low and just uh, trying to stay quiet about what's going on. And, uh, and we could talk about what you can do a little later. Okay, so now we're going to get into some important words. All right. So... Islam. Islam is the name of a religion. It is one of three that are considered of the Abrahamic faith traditions. The root word for the word Islam is Silim, S-L-M, which means peace, essentially achieving peace in self and on earth. Muslims are people who practice Islam. Uh, people are Muslims and the religion is called Islam. Islam is the religion, its followers are called Muslims, very good. Uh, believe me, people mistaken that all the time. Okay, so now the word Islamic. Islamic is an adjective. That's what that word is. It's an adjective that describes things related to Islam. Uh, there, there's a catch though. This adjective cannot be used for people. You cannot say someone is Islamic, but you can say Islamic clothing, Islamic art, Islamic book, uh, Islamic architecture, right? You can, you can name any, anything can be Islamic if it's related to Islam, but you can't, you can't say he's Islamic. He's a Muslim. Muslim. Very good. So. <laughs> How do you get to be a Muslim? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you that when we get to okay. one of the slides. <laughs> Okay, so here are some more words. Arab, Arab is someone whose origin is from the Arabian Peninsula or comes from an Arabic country. Um, countries uh, around the Arabian Peninsula and also in North Africa, like my country, Libya, right? Uh, Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern refers to a person or a custom. Uh, from a geographical region, including Southwest Asia, but oftentimes leaves out North Africa. So there is another term called MENA. Um, if we can have Grace write that, because this is actually quite important, and I should have put this up on the slide. Um, it's M-E-N, as in Nancy A, MENA. And that describes the area of North uh, Middle East. So it stands for Middle East and North Africa, MENA, Middle East 
and North Africa. It's more of an inclusive term uh, because, again, my country is not in the Middle East, even though people consider it, but it's really not. Uh, it's not in the you know South South uh, West Asia. So that's a better term to use for those uh, Muslim majority countries. Mira. Sunni. Um, Sunni is one of two major dominations within Islam. About 85 to 90 percent of Muslims belong to this group. Shia, Shiite is the other major domination. The word Shiite is an English term. Shia is the Arabic term. So if I say Shia, it is because I'm used to saying Shia, but it, it's literally the same thing as Shiite. Um, Shiite is the other major domination. Iraq, uh, in Iran, Bahrain, and as Azerbaijan uh, are majority Shia or Shiite. Uh, the main difference is in the way both see leadership. Uh, in Sunni Islam, leadership is not hereditary. Uh, so whoever is best fitted to lead will lead. Uh, and uh, in Shiite, it is hereditary. So today, uh, Sunnis do not have a leader. There's no one Khalifa, right? You probably heard that term, Khalifa, the leader of all Muslims. There is no Khalifa in Sunni Islam. There's no longer empires, right? Um, so uh, some Shiite do have leaders. Like in Iran, they follow someone. In India, they follow someone as well. There are some religious differences, but not much. I'll give you an example of a religious difference because I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, there's no difference except in leadership. There's sl some slight differences. So, for example, Muslims pray five times a day. Uh, in Shia Islam, they, they split their prayers up into three times during the day, as, and, and Sunnis split it into five. But if you ask a Shia, they'll say, well, we pray five times a day. It's just during three different parts of the day, so they're combining prayers. So it's still five times a day. Um, and also, uh, there's some slight differences in the words they say during prayer. So there's that. <coughs> Uh, let's see here. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting fact. If you meet an Arab in the United States, they're not going to be Muslim most likely. They're going to be Christian. You won't know it because, you know, they're not going to be covered up, right? Uh, but in fact, if you meet an Arab in the United States, they're most likely going to be Christian. Uh, the majority of Muslims in the United States are either black or um, South Asian. So when I say South Asian, um, I'm usually talking about uh, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. Uh, and so they're the majority of Muslims within the United States. So let's see. How many Muslims do you think there are worldwide? I want to see who has the best guess. Yes. Brazilians. How many? Brazilians. Okay, so I'm looking for a number. How many Muslims do you think worldwide? I'm looking for a number. How many Muslims? Yes. 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion? Okay. No, five Brazilians. Any other number? One more guess? Six billion. Six billion. Okay, so. Uh, I want to know. Are you a professor? <laughs> I did a little research before I came to you. Okay. <laughs> There's about 1.5 billion Muslims worldwide. Okay, let me ask, how many people in the world are there? <laughs> right, so six, yeah, six point something billion. I think it actually says it down there, 6.8 billion people in the world. So what is that? Is that every fourth person is a Muslim? Every third? Okay, is a Muslim, okay. How many are Christians? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it's definitely more. It's definitely more. Yep. It's definitely more? Yeah, it's definitely more. There's more Christians than Muslims for sure. Yeah. Okay, so in the United States, how many Muslims do you think live in the United States? Three. <laughs> I'm just saying very few. Okay, three, three what? One percent. Three people? 
She was joking. Was okay. She's a, she's a friend of mine. Okay. Yes. One percent of him. One percent. You're absolutely right. So how much would that be? I guess you can do the math if you think. Six million. Okay. So very good. Since there's no real census, um, people have figured out ways to estimate how many Muslims, and they say between three and seven million. So when you said three, that's why I'm like three what? Yeah. So but yeah, it's it's three million Muslims. Um, again, one percent of the U.S. population. I think there's 360 some million uh, Americans. Uh, and when I say Americans, I'm including undocumented. That's the way I view things, people living here, uh, residing in the United States. Uh, you know, the Muslim community is the most ethnically diverse American religious community. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. So here we are. This is the demographic of the Muslims in the United States. And we already kind of talked about, oh, does this have like a pointer? I don't think so. Sorry. Um, we kind of talked about how black, uh, blacks and also South Asian make up the majority. Um, and so African-Americans, 30 percent. But if we include African with that, that would be 33 percent. South Asian, again, uh, when we say South Asian, we're talking about India, Bangladesh, that part of uh, Asia. If we're talking about Southeast Asia, that's 2%. You know, China, Japan, um, down the other end. Indonesia as well. I don't know. That's a really good question. I actually thought about that quickly when creating the slide, and I should have looked that up. I, I, I can always find out and let you know. Um, can you tell me an interesting fact about Indonesia? Do you know anything special about There's something special about Indonesia. Well, there's lots of special yes. things about Indonesia. Yes, there's a, it's a beautiful they have country. volcanoes that go off all the time. Okay. <laughs> How about religiously? Is there something? Um, <laughs> yes, it has the, the most Muslims more than any other country, right, uh, percentage-wise. So, so that's... That's the interesting about uh, interesting thing about Indonesia. Are they Arab? No. No. But so another important thing. Of, uh, this is just because this confusion happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't need an exact number, but what percentage of Arabs are Muslim? Or so in Arabs? the United States, twenty-five percent. In the world. In the world, I don't know. But I know the largest populations are Indonesia, but also India. Right. They're not Arab, um, so they're not the most. But I don't know exactly what percentage they are. There's but a lot of confusion. You say you say it's Arab. People exactly, and let's remember, Iran is not Arab. Uh, a lot of people think Iranians. Yeah, they're Persians. In fact, if you come up to an Iranian and say, "Are you Arab?" Some of them actually will get very offended. They they don't speak Arabic, um, and they're not Arabs. They may look <laughs> like Arabs, but again, you know, there are many people that look Arab, right? It's not people like Arab. Really, just so. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's that. Um, I, yes. It, within the Muslim community in the United States, yes. is there a conflict between ethnic groups? Like in, in Christian churches, they tend to fall out very segregated by yep. ethnicity. Yep. Is that so uh, I think in the Christian church, it's by denomination, right? Well, yeah, but they're still very segregated. Okay, so segregated, in, in yes, church. it's one of uh, the issues within the Muslim community. I'm letting you in on some of our problems, <laughs> right? Um, we are very segregated in the United States, unfortunately. So you'll have a lot of black mosques, you'll have the African mosque, you'll have the Arab mosque, you have the Pakistani mosque, you'll have the uh, Bosnian mosque. It is a problem that, that we are trying to work with. People have voiced their concern about it because there are some communities that are more affluent than others. and so forth, so on and so forth. So we do have that issue. Um, the do way the mosques work, the I'll now answer that. That's a good question. Uh, the way the mosques work is that uh, the doors are open. Like they can't stop anyone from coming into a mosque. So if I wanted to go into an African-American mosque, <laughs> I can. And I, you'll see me use the word black and African-American interchangeably. And, and that, there's a reason. Some of my friends do not want to be called African-American. They refuse to. They think it's an insult because um, we don't do that to you know, uh, white people. We don't say Irish-American, Italian-American. You're just American, right? And so some of them refuse to take that. And so they want to be called black. And then I actually have friends who don't want to be called black, want to be called African-American. So I, I use them interchangeably. Um, and so. Uh, 
So you, I can go to a black mask. In fact, in Georgia, I felt most comfortable in a black mask. Going back to your question about separation, uh, that is more cultural than religious, the separation of genders. And so what tends to happen is in the black mosques, uh, they're usually in one room. They're not separated. I'm most comfortable being in a room with my religious leader. And so I try to attend mosques that include uh, women in the same space. And then uh, there's a lot of mosques that don't do that. And that uh, usually comes, stems from a cultural practice within their own countries uh, where they separate men and women. And so they come to the United States and uh, they'll carry on those uh, traditions. And so even though it's a religious house of worship, but religiously there's no basis because uh, during the prophet's time, men and women were actually in one room. But it's become very much a part of the, so ingrained in the culture that for me to ask someone to, uh, to make us in the same room is offensive to some Muslims. And so, um, so there's a middle ground. The middle ground uh, that I think is that should happen is that if women want to be in the same room, we should create a space to allow them. And if and if they want to be in another room, and I've, I've literally come across some woman who said, no, I want to be in a separate room, do not come into my mosque and demand things that we don't want. And I realize that is very, that is, that is a perception or perspective that I need to respect. And so um, it would be great if they created a space for those women that don't want to be in the same room and then make, making sure that those who do want to be in the same room, and I think women have that right, um, to have the same access as men to their religious leaders, right? Because what happens when you remove access to women, uh, you know, they can't reach out to the leaders, they can't tell them, hey, I'm being abused, or this is happening, or these are some things that need to be on your radar, right? If you tell people that, they can also say, well, we'll give opportunities for women, we give women classes, they can always write us, they can always make appointments, but again, that lack of access to me is problematic, but to some people, they want it that way. Yes? Is this a Sunni-Shia difference? Oh, no. Uh, matter of fact, the mosque that I went to, they're, they're Sunni, they all pray together, and then there's Sunni mosques that 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 separate. So no, it's not a Sunni Shia. So in Arlington, they do separate. Then. Uh, I think the majority of mosques separate. Yep, unfortunately. But that's why, again, I like to go to the African American mosques because they don't do that. There's a, a, an origin. Uh, they've been here longer. There's almost like an American kind of um, Islam. And we'll talk about that. The Islam looks very different in, in different countries. So if we go to Saudi Arabia, the way they practice Islam is going to be very different than the way they practice in, in um, I don't know, Pakistan. Even their clothes are completely different, right? Um, and so I may have more in common with someone from Saudi Arabia, uh, I mean, from someone from New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey, right? Than from someone in Saudi Arabia, right? Just even though we have the same religion, but I mean, I. I grew up here most of my life. It's just the culture is, is I'm more culturally uh, American, and so I may have more in common with, with a non-Muslim, right? So that's important. Uh, okay, so you talked about diversity. We talked about diversity. This is a really important slide. Muslims are very diverse. In fact, this is the most important point that I want to come across today. Like this, is, if you get anything from this presentation, please get this. We are so diverse, right? Um, we have different cultures, educational backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, different professions. We speak different languages, uh, differ in the way they practice their faith. And we just talked about one aspect, you know, prayer and. Um, and so uh, they're very, they're just, they're not a mono, monolithic, right? There's no uh, monolithic way of being a Muslim, right? There's no one way. Um, there's no Sharia law, right? There's no one way that all Muslims agree uh, how we should live, right? Um, and so now we'll talk about Islam and Muslims, but before we do that, yes? I think you're, what I was going to ask was, if you had to say what are important core values, practices across yes. the diversity. I and thank you so much. Yeah, I'm actually getting there. Thank you so much for that question because I am actually getting there. Um, but I do want you to notice the picture. Of the, the Muslims are very diverse, right? So we have a woman, two women covering their hair, one that doesn't, right? Just and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So Islam. As we mentioned earlier, Islam is one of the religions that are considered uh, Abrahamic faith traditions. Muslims see their religion as a continuation of Judaism and Christianity. The Quran refers to Jews and Christians as the people of the book. 
uh, it's always intriguing to me when I tell people that um, we share a lot of the same stories or uh, the prophets that are mentioned in the Quran are also mentioned in the Bible. They get surprised, like, what? I thought it was something so totally different, but they don't see that really Muslims view their religion as just a continuation of the very same Judaism and uh, Christianity. Um, they also believe uh, in Jesus, so they revere him very much, but the major difference between Christianity and Islam is actually the way Muslims um, view Jesus as a prophet as opposed to being divine. So that's, that's where they differ. So um, he's considered one of the, the most respected prophets, but they don't um, consider him to be divine. Um, Muslims also share practices with Jews as well, like Jews. So for example, there's dietary restrictions. Muslims can't eat pork um, in clothing. Some Jews uh, you know, will, will also cover their hair, right? Um, and uh, also taking time off uh, during the day to pray five times a day. And some Jews do that. And we know some Christians as well, right, before going to bed and going to church also take time uh, during the day to pray. So yes. When I was growing up, uh, I was raised Catholic, and in those days, women did not enter a church without mm. their head covered. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, yes. I appreciate you mentioning that. Yes, and we'll get up to the head covering, so I'm glad you added that, that bit there. Um, okay, and so now we'll talk about beliefs. Okay, we talked about how diverse Muslims are, but... There are, there's a string that goes along as them that, that brings Muslims together. So what are they? They are uh, the beliefs. Now, there are five major beliefs in Islam. Muslims believe in a one God. Uh, is a monotheist, it's a monotheistic faith. Allah is just the Arabic word for God. So who knows how to say God in Spanish? Dios. Okay, Dios, very good. How about in French? Yes, oh wow, you guys are okay. Uh, in Hebrew? <coughs> okay, all right. Uh, so in Arabic, it's Allah. That's simple as that. Uh, okay, and then Muslims believe in angels. So um, angels are creation uh, by God. And Muslims believe that they do not have free will, they just merely serve God. Uh, angel Gabriel is the angel that is believed by Muslims to have given revelation to Prophet Muhammad and other prophets according to uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, the next thing is Muslims also believe in prophets. They believe God has sent prophets throughout time to show and tell people how to live a righteous life. Um, some prophets mentioned in the Quran are Abraham, Noah, Moses, David, Jacob, Adam, and others as well. Muslims believe in uh, other revealed scriptures. Uh, including the original Bible and Torah. Uh, Muslims believe in an afterlife uh, so that one day the world will come to an end and everyone will stand before God and be judged according to the way they live their lives. And last, Muslims believe in a divine decree. Basically, it means that uh, God knows what happened in the past, God knows what will happen in the future, and it's all of uh, a part of one big divine plan that we just need to trust in God. So, any questions before I move on? So, those are the major beliefs. What was the word for God? Allah. 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 Yep. Is God male or female? And um, according to Islamic tradition, God is not male or female. Yep. You'll also notice, uh, just before I move on, speaking of Allah, you'll see Muslims don't usually draw um, God. There's no images of God usually. And I say usually because Muslims are so diverse. So if you go into books, maybe you'll find a picture or, or two, right? But for the most part, you won't find images of God. They think he transcends all things that we can see, right? Okay, so the practices. Okay, so um, these are the things that hold up Islam. The way pillars hold up a building, these are called the pillars of Islam. So the first one is Shahada. Shahada is a declaration of faith. This is how someone becomes Muslim. Um, and hope that answers uh, your question. <laughs> uh, it is basically saying that there's only one God and that Muhammad was his final messenger. And by doing so, one is declaring the belief in all the other prophets before Muhammad as well. Uh, Muslims pray five times a day. Is there, is there a special ceremony for the, for the testimony of faith? Uh, there just needs to be two witnesses. So as long as there's two witnesses, usually what tends to happen is people go to a mosque in order to get those two witnesses in front of everyone to let people know um, the reason why that's important. This doesn't have to be, but 
what people tend to do uh, is because they'll need a sense of community and if you're not reaching out to people letting them know hey I'm Muslim then people won't know and people won't invite you over to their house not 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 to say that they don't invite non-Muslims but it's, it's, it's just to say that they'll kind of take extra care of this so person what about kids? Are they are, do they, are they, are you, if you're Oh, okay, thank you. So there's no, like, baptism? Thank you, that's a really good question. No, um, like, for example, I was just born into the faith. I didn't have to uh, uh, officially in front of everyone say my shahada. Like, I didn't have to. But uh, I'm constantly saying it in prayer, and uh, so I say it a lot. Um, but no, I, there's no, like, uh, official formal ceremony, if, if that's what you're asking. But you are. Yes. Your parents are, you are. Uh, not necessarily. So some people have converted out of uh, Islam and became something else. So that's very possible as well. But um, it's it's really um, I think it's more important the belief inside, right? Saying that there is only one God and and that Muhammad is his messenger. Um, but formally, the scholars this is just their opinion. You have to have two witnesses if you are converting um, from another faith into Islam. So do kids pray five times a day, or do they? How does that? When does that start? That's a really good question. Actually, there's a, a slide on prayer, and I will get to that. And, and if I don't address that, please do just raise your hand, remind me, and, and I'll make sure I address that. Yeah. Um, okay, so we talked about how uh, shahada, we talked about declaration, praying five times. Uh, praying five times a day, this is supposed to connect people to God, and I'll go over the movements really quickly. So. I think this is important. So the reason why I do this, let me turn this off for a second, is in case you see, in case you see Muslims, um, you'll know what they're doing. And I don't want, what tends to happen, I also gave cultural sensitivity training to police officers in Georgia. And the reason why I did that is it's important for people to know what prayer looks like. So when they see it, uh, they don't think something bad is going to happen because literally people are calling the police when they see Muslims pray. Because in movies, when Muslims pray, they're about to commit a violent act, forgetting that Muslims pray five times a day, right? So let me just show you. <laughs> So this is um, this is not my magic carpet. This is my prayer rug, right? <laughs> Speaking of Orientalism, right? Um, okay. And so basically, they have to pray in a clean place. Um, I'm actually just gonna quickly take off my shoes just to make it easier. So this is the first movement, just so that you know the movements. I'm not gonna go over everything, but uh, this is this is the first movement. We say some things. This is the second movement. You go up, and then this is the most famous picture that you'll see is Muslims will put their forehead to the ground. So uh, so my knees are on the ground, my hands and my forehead, and that's prostration. Like that, we say uh, three things. God is glorious, God is glorious, God is glorious. We come up and go back down again. God is glorious, God is glorious, God is glorious. And then we um, come up again, say some things. Um, to ourselves and sometimes out loud, it depends on if we're in congregation praying together, uh, do this, God is greatest, God is greatest, God is greatest. And then again, forehead to the ground. Um, during the day, uh, the amount of um, a set, we're gonna call this a set, from, from me standing to my head on the foreground, for, on the ground. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get to my mic so you can hear me. Okay, can you hear me? Um, we call that a set where I was standing and then my head goes to the ground. And that differs uh, throughout the day. So in the morning it's two. Uh, for the Dhuhr prayer it's four. Asa prayer it's four. Mullah prayer it's three sets. Um, Isha prayer it is uh, four sets. And so um, Muslims also have one day that's a holy day that they will go to the mosque, similar to how Christians will go to church every Sunday. And, and then the religious holiday for Jews is Saturday. Um, and so Muslim holy day is Friday. They'll go to, to the mosque and they'll pray congregational prayer. Uh, okay, so that's prayer. Does prayer look the same across uh, all, all the Yes. Um, yep. It's the same exact movements. There is slight, slight um, difference between the Shia. Just um, I didn't show you at the very end. After I prostrate, we sit. Um, and I should have showed you that movement, but because again, you have to know. <laughs> but it looks like just me sitting down like this, uh, and then we say some things. And then to end, we'll, we'll do this. Um, for Shia, it's just a little different. I know they do something with their hands, slightly different. So um, there's slight variations, but basically it's the same thing. And, and you'll see it in pictures and, and yes. 
elderly and disabled people. Oh, like my mother, <laughs> yeah. So my mother actually uses a seat. So if you can't do all that, you can sit down and you're still lightly doing some of the movements. So for example, um, like this, to, to bend when I was, was bending like this, and then where my forehead is to the ground, she'll just go a little further. So that, that's a really good question, because not all people can uh, do all the movements, right? Some people have bad knees and... I'm sorry? Washing of the feet. Yes, oh my gosh, yeah. So uh, before prayer, there is something called wudu, uh, and it's a ritual wash. Um, and it is uh, washing the hands, mouth, nose, face, uh, head once, ears, and then feet three times. And so um, I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically it's done before prayer. It doesn't have to be done before every prayer. If you're purified, and uh, that means if you didn't go to the bathroom and you didn't pass gas, and it's time for the next prayer, then you don't have to do the, purifi the purification. Yeah, it's, so that's that. You asked, and I answered. How long, how long is each? Oh, it's, thank you. That's a really good question. So it takes about three minutes to do prayer. Yeah, between three, the most five minutes. If people really want to get into it and do it real slow, um, it's not like you can just choose your words. You actually have specific uh, verses from the Quran that you say during prayer. Um, so the first is like a mandatory uh, a verse from the Quran, uh, and then um, a chapter rather from the Quran, uh, and then you could choose any other chapter from the holy book to say. But again, you can't choose it. You can't, I mean, you could choose the, the chapter, but you can't say whatever you want to say. That happens after prayer, when people are sitting down, and you'll usually see them do this. That's when they're saying whatever they want to say, and they're asking God for whatever. So I think, uh, well, I'm not even going to get into that. Let's, let's just keep it this. I know it's them, and I'll stick with this them. <laughs> um, I don't want to say the Christians do this when they pray. You can compare it to that, but in Islam, it's like this, right? The hands. Are there certain times during the day? Yes, um, pre-dawn. I think I think there's a slide on that. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll get into that too. Um, okay, so we got up to praying. Uh, yep, and then Muslims give charity. So um, though you can give charity any time of the year any time in your life, um, Muslims are actually required to give charity uh, of their savings. So if you're saving money aside by the end of the year, you have to take 2% and give it to charity. Um, that's mandatory. You can also give extra charity, that's fine, but um, it is required that people give 2% of their savings. So I think that's important because people get shocked and like, I, like, I have to give 2% of my wealth. It's like, no, only what you've saved for the whole year untouched money for the whole year, 2% of that has to go to the poor. Is that connected to, I have an idea that I don't know where I got it, but you can get that Muslims are extraordinarily hospitable. Yes. Um, that that's got to be so ingrained. Absolutely. What's, is there a connection to it? There absolutely is a connection. Um, I can't even, if you go to where my parents are from, their doors are always open. There is no such thing as calling someone when you come. And when they, when they come over, you can't ask them to leave. You can't say, oh, I have to go somewhere. It's suddenly everything it will be put on hold. You take out the food. You, it's very, yeah, it's very hospitable and very um, giving. Yep. So that's that. Any other questions? OK, and then? Um, we talked about charity here. Muslims fast once a year during the holy month of Ramadan, which we'll um, talk about that in a second. And Hajj. Um, Hajj, uh, Muslims have to make a pilgrimage uh, to Hajj once in their lifetime. So Hajj is in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And here it is. Take a look at that picture. Those little specks are actually people. Every year, two million people make their way to Saudi Arabia. Um, Hajj, that building there is called the Kaaba. Um, it commemorates uh, the trials and the journeys of Abraham and his family. Um, it is believed, according to Islamic tradition, that Prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael built the Kaaba. And then it's been rebuilt many, many times. But um, just the thing that you have to know is that when Muslims pray, they face this building here. 
Uh, and so that's important. And the other thing you have to know is one time during their lifetime, they have to make this pilgrimage. And that is if they can afford it. There are some people who can't afford it. And so people are not forcing them to, right? But if they can afford it, they have to once in their lifetime make this pilgrimage. Yes. But on those, the basis of the numbers that you're quoting here, only a very small fraction actually are able to do it. Yes. Yep. It's very expensive. I have yet to do it. And it's a shame because I actually lived in Saudi Arabia. Um, I went to visit this, but uh, when it was time to make the Hajj, there's a certain quota. What they do is they don't just allow anyone to come in. They know there's not enough space for everyone. It has to be in the single digits of percentage of total Yes. And they accept, yeah, exactly. And they accept like a certain quota from every country. Uh, for people to come and, and actually do this. But like you said, it's, it's really expensive. So there are many people who have not done the pilgrimage. And so there are attempts to uh, make sure that those who haven't, maybe people can donate to help those who haven't uh, actually make the pilgrimage. This is, is this at a certain time of the year? Or yes, it is uh, during a certain time of the year. And um, you probably don't know what they're doing, but what they're doing is they're circum like going around the Kaaba seven times. And what's interesting is the men are all in white. They have two, cl two pieces of cloth. Uh, and this is to basically create the sense of equality. So um, if you are rich, you're not wearing your special, you know, like it's literally to create a sense of equal before God. The men and women are not segregated here. Um, and Saudi Arabia doesn't have an issue with it then, right? They can't. <laughs> you know? well, I'm also imagining that the airlines and the hotels bump up the prices Absolutely. during that week or two, or just like they would for any, oh, we know that exactly. four million people coming here. Let's exactly. And unfortunately, there's also been accidents as well. And when accidents happen, many, many people die as well. Yes. And I understand that the, um, is it Kaaba? Kaaba. What it's called? Contains a meteorite. Oh, yeah, so there's the black stone <laughs> yeah, that Muslims believe is a meteorite. Um, they try to touch it, but it is so hard to get to. I'm I, an astronomer, so I have to ask. Oh, that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they believe that came from the heavens, yeah. right? Well, and yes. they try to touch it, and they try to make a special prayer. But with this amount of people, I guarantee you, not everyone's touching it. I was able to. I didn't make the Hajj, but I lived in Saudi Arabia for two years. No, 10 months, 10 months. Uh, I got to visit this, but not during the Hajj season. You talked about you can't just go and make the pilgrimage. It's only one time a year, a certain time. I went when it wasn't that time. Even though I lived in Saudi Arabia, I wasn't allowed to go, so they didn't allow me to um, because they have a certain quota. They you know, allow people from certain you know areas. Uh, and so I got to touch it, and it was amazing. And this thing right here, this building, this gold stuff that you see, is actually real gold, and they changed this. This this material. So, but um, yeah, it's a, quite an amazing site. Okay. Okay, fasting. Um, during the month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month in the Islamic calendar, people have to abstain, or Muslims rather, <laughs> have to abstain from food and drink from when the sun comes up till the sun comes down. So um, it's important to mention that the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. It's not like our Gregorian calendar. That just means that days are um, the months are 11 days earlier every single year. So Ramadan may fall in the winter, one you know one year and then years later may fall in the summer because every year it's 11 days earlier uh, and so uh, during this period of time the reason why this is a significant month is Muslims believe that that's when Muhammad received revelation from the angel Gabriel that he is a prophet and that uh, uh, this is the message from God and so what Muslims tend to do during the month of Ramadan is read the whole Quran they try to go to the mosque and they're praying and during their prayers they're reading verses from the Qur'an until they try to finish the Qur'an. So that's something you should know. And they're very cha extra charitable during this month. And they're also inviting friends over and there's a lot of visits during this month. Uh, so what happens is I wake up before the sun comes out. I eat as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then um, no eating, no drinking. And in case you don't know, there's also no um, marital affairs, which means literally sex, right? No sex either. Um, and then when the sun goes down, Usually, oh, I know where your mind's going. Okay. 
when the sun goes down, people usually break their fast with dates. So you always see picture. I, I decided to choose dates for the month of Ramadan because they usually break their fast with dates. Um, the Prophet ate a lot of dates, and so people will. That's the month where everybody goes and buys dates. They break their fast with milk usually, and tamar. Tamar is the Arabic word for dates. Um, and then they have a big, huge feast. Now, if you are a Muslim and you cheat, what some Muslims have done is they'll sleep during the day, <laughs> yeah, and then they'll wake up and then just literally stay up. And unfortunately, in countries, it's really they create the environment to be able to do that. They're like, oh, but it's fasting. That's why we don't have to come to work, right? So that's not what's supposed to happen. The reason why people fast is so that you're supposed to feel how it, how it feels to, to be hungry and not be able to eat. You know, that's the one time that those who can afford to eat all the time finally experience hunger, real hunger pains. And that's one of the reasons why they're more charitable during the month of Ramadan, right? Yes. Is this where our expression go out on a date came from? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. I think that's that's good for Ramadan. That's good for Ramadan. Well, After this, Ramadan. I can say this is sort of a joke back. Okay. Uh, I lived in Kuwait for a while. Oh. And the streets at midnight when Ramadan were popping. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you literally experience what I actually just said. Yeah. Everything is so different during and yeah, they have special series on TV, like certain soap operas. People are like it's very different. It's not the way it's supposed to be, but people have created their own little way of doing things. Um, so after the month of Ramadan, there is a major holiday. So there are two Muslim holidays during the year. The first one's called Eid al-Fitr, which is breaking of the fast. And then the second one's called Eid al-Adha. They're celebrated the same way, so I'll tell you quickly how they celebrate it. They'll wake up, uh, they get very special dressy clothes on, the best clothes, They usually it's usually new clothes. They go to the mosque, pray, and then after that they visit family, gifts, and um, and all that good stuff. So that's um, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha is the festival of the sacrifice and it commemorates Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son and then God sending a ram in his place, right? So that's that second uh, Muslim holiday. I have, I have a question. Yes. They only, they only fast one, that one the whole month. day? Oh, the whole month. A whole month, one whole month called Ramadan. Yep, it's actually coming soon in May. And how many days is it? Uh, 30 days. It's 30 days. During, yeah, it's a lunar calendar, so we have so, to look at the moon. So you have to cheat. No, no. Oh, yeah, so it's not cheating when you're actually eating. When yeah, So when the sun goes down, what's supposed to happen is you wake up early, you eat, you don't eat during the day, the sun goes down, you eat, but then you sleep, you don't stay awake. And then take advantage of like the the nighttime and just eat away. You're supposed to live your regular life, but feel the pains, the hunger pains, right? And so um, I I I'm so happy during that month because I usually lose at least five six pounds. <laughs> I'm like the belly that I'm so worried about is not here anymore. So um, yeah, yes. Ah uh, no, actually Muslims read it um, throughout the year um, and. If you hear it, it's it's almost like a, like a song, and they have competitions and people memorize it. So I have four boys, um, and uh, three memorize uh, how many chapters? Not thirty. Oh, ten. Like so, the 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 book is divided into thirty. They memorize ten of the thirty. So it's it's a it's an honorable thing to memorize the Quran, right? Uh, the Quran is in Arabic. There are translations in every language, but it's only considered holy and the word of God if it's written, uh, if it's read in Arabic. So even prayers, I'll be honest, my Arabic is horrible. I am Arab, I know, but I, I was raised here and unfortunately there were no schools that taught me Arabic. Uh, so, but we learned the, the, the Quran in Arabic and I'll say my prayers in Arabic, including converts, they'll learn it in Arabic because it's only holy only God's words if it's in Arabic. So whenever you read the Quran, you pull it off the shelf and you're reading verses, it's actually someone's interpretation of the Arabic. So that's something that's important to, to keep in mind. Thank you. That's an excellent question.
Okay, so here are more important words. Assalamu alaikum. You probably heard this word. This is the Muslim greeting. When Muslims see other Muslims, this is the first thing they say. Assalamu alaikum. How much time do we have? You're ready. Okay, so I better hurry up. Uh, assalamu alaikum means peace be upon you. Allahu Akbar is a very important word because it's taken out of context. It means God is greatest. I say this whenever I'm happy. My son scores a goal. Allahu Akbar. It does not mean I'm going to bomb something like they you know, say in movies. Inshallah means God willing. Alhamdulillah means praise be to God. And this word jihad, it's a really important word. You have to understand it actually means to strive. It does not mean holy war like everyone wants to translate it as. It actually means striving. And so uh, the Prophet said the greatest jihad, the greatest striving is to uh, strive to control yourself, your nafs, your, your, your desire to, to do whatever it is that you want to do, right? And so um, can it mean uh, fighting? Yes, to strive to defend yourself. So it can mean that. But it really just means striving, but it's always taken out of context <laughs> in our country. So let me go on. Um, research, oh, this is actually, mm. do you want me to go over this? I'm almost done. But uh, just as any faith uh, and secular groups, there are violent Muslims as well. Statistics show that the majority of violent attacks in the United States are carried out by non-Muslims, yet Muslims are the ones associated with terrorism. People can find justification in texts for their political agenda, just as they can in any holy book, by taking verses out of context. Research shows that the group that carries out the most violence in the US is the alt-right, framing their language around survive, surviving extinction. So, um, though the threat is not as widespread as our society makes it out to be, Islamic uh, terrorism, um, there are Muslims who do, uh, do go out and do horrible, horrendous things, just as there are people in all faiths. And so, are there Muslims um, fighting this? Yes, there are actually Muslims are working uh, against violence within their own communities. I am one of them. I'm um, the first of a, a group of cohorts that, that is in the Carter Center. We have, um, the study is right here, but what we're trying to do is combat terrorism within our own communities. And what we found is there's no way you can combat terrorism without combating Islamophobia. They literally feed each other. So uh, the reason why uh, these violent groups, including Daesh, which you know as ISIS, um, I don't like to call them ISIS. ISIS means Islamic State, right? We don't want to give them any legitimacy. But the reason why they're able to recruit people is Muslims are being so othered that and, and when there's no communities to make them feel like they belong, what tends to happen is they're doing an excellent job recruiting people online. And so that's why I fight Islamophobia and extremism. So that means on the Muslim end, we create environments where they feel like they belong. And at the same time, we call out the things that we do here to make Muslims feel othered, right? And last slide. Uh, woman's dress. This is quite important. Uh, so if you take a look at the picture of the, the woman there, there's a variety of ways Muslim women dress. Some may cover their hair, dress in loose fitting attire. A few women may cover their face, called niqab. Uh, some may not cover their hair at all. Some African American women may cover uh, like the way that, that uh, the black woman in the top uh, left hand corner is covered. Actually, your, yeah, your last right. <laughs> all right. Um, and so really fast, um, we all know that Muslims aren't the only ones that cover it. And Bob was very kind to remind us that, that uh, he remembers a time when, when uh, people used to go into church and have to cover their hair, right? We've all seen replicas of Mary, whether in Christmas, I don't, sometimes I go into churches, but um, you've seen replicas of Mary, right? Uh, covering her hair. You've seen Jewish women who cover their hair. You, nuns, you're all familiar with nuns. But why is it that whenever we say Islam and Muslims, all of a sudden this is, is considered oppress oppressive, right? So uh, the main thing I want you to get out of it is uh, this is not necessarily oppressive. The act of forcing anyone to, to dress a certain way is oppressive. So when we have countries like Saudi Arabia who force women to cover, that's oppressive. When we have countries like France who, who force women to take it off, that's also oppressive. So we're did the practice come from uh, during pre-Islam, before the advent of Islam? Uh, the only women that covered their hair were a certain class of women, a noble woman, and it was to let those in the market know that they belonged to a certain family or a tribe, and if anybody dared uh, harm them or anything, their tribe got their back. So when Islam came, it was to raise the status of women to these other women that nobody should harm. Or So it's not really linked to 
people want to make it out to be linked to a sexual, like so women are not sexualized or whatever. And some some women will say that. So um, if you ask why Muslim women cover, my answer will be very different than someone else's answer, right? Uh, some women do it just because it's culturally, they see their parents do it and they're a part of a culture that does it. And so they do it for that reason. Some women will say because it's prescribed in the holy book, the Quran, it says to tell the believing woman to dress modestly and cover, right? And so they believe that it is a part of their faith and so they'll do it for that. Some women do it out of protest uh, because they've been colonized for so long and it's a way to take back their identity and say this is who I am and you're not going to tell me what I, I should look like or, or should dress like, right? And so there's many different reasons why Muslim women cover and it's important if I get, if you want to learn anything, it's that it's not oppressive. It's, it's what happens uh, if it's forced, it's oppressive. Right? If, if it's removed, like you're forced to remove it, that's also oppressive. So that's the thing that I want you to remember. Some people interpret uh, the face covering as some modesty and they, they need to do that. So you'll see some women also cover their face. Yes? Uh, I heard a Muslim woman talk about it and we were saying, how can you want to cover your face? And she said, I like it because they can't tell whether I'm smiling or <laughs> right. Right, and I, I'll be honest because I get this question a lot, and, and then some. I, a lot of times people will tell me, "Oh, but you're not like the other woman, you know, the woman that covered." And they don't literally make a face. The woman that covered their face, you're not like that. And I'm like, "Well, what do you mean? I'm not like that." I have Muslim women friends who cover their face, and they're lawyers. They're way smarter than me. They know a lot. So, like, what is what does that imply? I'm not like everyone else. So, uh, I think it's important when we see uh, people covered. It doesn't mean that they're from a different country. There are people that were born he born and raised here, right? It just means uh, that they do it for whatever reasons that they do it, and we need to accept and respect their decision to uh, cover if they choose to cover. Um, I think. Oh, last slide, which is quite important. Oh. Here we go, what you can do. Okay, so um, these are some things that I just wanted to make sure I shared. Well, if what you can do, ask ourselves if um, I'm being biased by thinking about this person a certain way. If we see someone, we there's stereotypes that come at us, right? So ask, let's ask ourselves, are we, are we being biased by thinking that this person will have an accent? And they may have an accent, and so what if they do? Does that mean they're less learned? Maybe they know more than us. Maybe they speak two languages where we only speak one, right? Um, <laughs> Make a purposeful attempt to be kind to those with an accent or li look different than us, right? And I've seen many people do this in the Upper Valley, so I uh, honestly, that's one of the things that I, uh, that, that I appreciate. Uh, some people literally go out of their way to be nice. Uh, if you see a hate crime, this is something that's really important. If you see a hate crime, and I've been a victim of hate crimes, many Muslims have, right? And what I've noticed is people do nothing. They freeze. And it doesn't mean they're bad people, but good people but they just don't know what to do right and let's go back in history we interned Japanese and there were a lot of good people then too right so um, what I'm asking people to do what our uh, organization my ex organization uh, usually ask people to do is when you see something happening to a Muslim or anyone right discrimination or pretend to know that person don't engage the the perpetrator just ignore that he's even there, pretend to know the person, and then just walk with them somewhere else. So just take them out of harm's way. Um, but don't talk to the, the, the perpetrator. Uh, support organizations that deal with Muslim issues. CARE is one of those organizations. Uh, know that um, whenever somebody bad does something, uh, it's an exception. It's not the general rule. And so, just like in Christianity, you have the bad apples, right? Timothy McVeigh, nobody's like, oh my God. It's Christianity, it's, it's, we know, it's just the bad apple. The same is true for Islam and Muslims. We have our bad apples and just know, oh my God, okay, a Muslim did something horrible. Uh, that's just him. It doesn't mean it's his faith, right? Uh, speak out against bad policies and write to newspapers when they're being biased. So, if a newspaper is always calling a Muslim a terrorist, maybe write and say, hey, uh, you know, you're always using the word terrorist for Muslims. Can you also extend that to other terrorists? <laughs> um, they deserve it too. And also, uh, why aren't there any positive images of Muslims? Are you telling me you can't bring a Muslim on and say some of the good that they're doing in the community? Especially, I call it responsible reporting. If you're going to put out a bad story, it's going to have a ripple effect, right? So don't, aren't you, shouldn't you be responsible enough to have a counter story, what Muslims are actually doing 
uh, in, within their communities so that people are not connecting all the, the negative uh, stereotypes with Islam and Muslims. And I think that is about it. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I also, this is the, the Carter Center book that I, they did a study on terrorism. Uh, only 9% of the terrorists, you know, like ISIS, use only 9% of their rhetoric is religious in nature. The rest is grievances, Muslim grievances, like the West hates you. And they literally use 12% of uh, their, their videos are real videos from the West. <laughs> Politicians and also people in the media saying bad things about Islam to get people to join. So this is a study. Uh, this is the hate crimes uh, report 2016 that CARE has done about uh, hate and bias towards Muslims. And this is... Um, the book Orientalism, and this right here is a pretty awesome gum called Islamophobin. <laughs> you can you can go to Kara's website and order it, but if you want to take pictures with it, it's really cool. So if I go to an airport and somebody's just being Islamophobic, I'm like, do you need Islamophobin? <laughs> <laughs> so you can take pictures of this if you like as well. Thank you. Thank you.